Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to this uh, last external seminar of the year from the Welcome Center. And my name is Cristian Montenegro. I'm a research fellow here at the center. And I'm very happy and excited to host uh, this seminar. This is a fully online seminar due to a number of conditions and situations, as you can see maybe through your window. Um, but we hope it's going to be engaging and, and in interesting, and, and we know it's a, it's a very relevant topic. So the title of today's seminar is The Housing Crisis in the UK and its Impact on Families. Uh, this is based on both on work conducted by colleagues here at the center, and also we have the lack of having here Matt Dodd, who uh, gonna, is going to give you uh, give us a, an overview of the housing crisis in the Devon area. So I'm going to give some introductions now. Uh, Matt Dodd is the head of the Devon Housing Commission at the Exeter University, which was set up by the local authorities across Devon and the university to explore solutions to Devon's housing crisis. Matt is on a secondment from Homes England, which is the government's housing and regeneration agency, where he led nationally on rural and community-led housing and was a senior affordable housing strategy manager. He has worked in housing for the last 17 years and has previously worked in central government departments as a policy lead and private secretary to a uh, Lord's Minister. Matt has a degree in law and Italian from the University of Cardiff and the University of Parma and lives in Exeter. Um, we also have our own Dr. Felicity Thomas. Uh, Dr. Thomas is a co-director of the Welcome Center for Cultures and Environments of Health. Um, she is also called co-director of the WHO Collaborating Center on Culture and Health and works closely with the WHO Regional Office for Europe on the Cultural Context of Health program. Her work has focused around the mental health and well-being of low-income communities in the UK and Central and Eastern Europe, early life trauma, migrant health, sexual health, and the promotion of young people's health and well-being. She graduated from University College London with a BA honors in Anthropology and Geography, and later undertook a PhD on the impacts of HIV and AIDS on rural livelihoods in Namibia. Finally, I would like to also uh, um, say that, unfortunately, Thomas Elhos, who was going to give a, a, a presentation today, couldn't make it because he's not feeling very well. We, we hope that he recovers soon. Thomas uh, is a research fellow at the, at the center uh, and his research expertise is in the mapping, conceptualization, and comparison of child protection systems. His research also considers, um, sorry, his research also contributes to thorny debates regarding international NGO involvement in child protection, the search for relevant practice models in developing countries, and the suitability of existence theories to low and middle income context. Here at the Welcome Center, um, his work is on an, an engaged research project working with the Torbay Council to remodel their early health support for families and children. So today we will start uh, with Matt uh, with a presentation titled The Housing Crisis Across Devon. Then we, we will have a presentation by Dr. Felicity Thomas uh, titled Housing and Children's Social Care in England, learning from embedded research. Uh, we will then have a short break uh, for the captioner, uh, a five minute break. And at the end, we will have a, a Q and A that I will share uh, for people to ask questions and, 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 and also share their own thoughts about this topic. So without further ado, um, I'll leave you with Matt Dodd, who will start with his presentation. Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for inviting me along to uh, this seminar. Um, I am going to, I was about to share my screen, but it just says host disabled. Ah, oh, there we go, it's fine. Um, here we go. So, can everybody see that as a presentation rather than as a, a screen share? No, I, 
Is that no, okay? Yeah, now it's a presentation, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so um, what I just wanted to do today was give a, a little bit of information about the Devon Hand. issues that that we're seeing across Devon because they um they, they relate to to what's happening uh, nationally um and also um relate to the presentation that we'll hear later on about some uh, more specific studies that's been done in in Tor Bay so this is a quite a broad presentation just giving you some ideas about some of the challenges that are being faced so just firstly what is the Devon Housing Commission um I just wanted to um touch on this the Devon Housing Commission was set up earlier this year uh, by a group called the Devon Housing Task Force which is cross-party group of local politicians um, who, who across Devon so all the local authorities Devon uh, is a two-tier county and has unitary authorities in Plymouth and Torbay and then districts in, in all the others so that's 10 different authorities in total plus Devon County Council that's 11 and it's supported by Exeter University so it's quite a partnership of um, of people have set up the Devon Housing Commission and there are four sort of key aims for that firstly uh, is to actually develop a clear picture of what's going on in Devon we hear a lot of um, uh, a lot of individual studies or individual statistics in task force wanted to try and bring that together into a clearer picture so the commission is doing that initially uh, we're gathering in loads and loads of evidence and we have a call for evidence on our web page uh, i'll provide these slides afterwards perhaps with a link on there to our web page so people can can um, can contribute to that if they wish so that's the first stage and we're, we're, we're right in that stage now we started at the end of may um, uh, and, and this is sort of what we're doing at the moment. A uh, part of that is understanding the future needs. So the current picture, but also the future need uh, in order to support Dera Devon as a thriving economic place um, uh, and to support um, up, uh, social mobility for Devon's residents. Um, as part of that, we move on to what the commission will produce and, and um, the idea is that we give back to the Devon Housing Task Force, this cross-party group of politicians, a number of different recommendations. Uh, those recommendations will focus on things that can be done quickly, uh, so perhaps around how the local authorities work together, how planning works, how um, local housing numbers are calculated, but also broader and wider in looking at national policy uh, and what influence Devon can have uh, over over national policy uh, and also sort of underlying all of this is making sure that the the problems that Devon faces which are faced by many other places but in some cases Devon is much more extreme uh, are recognized on a, um, a cross Devon basis but also on a wider national basis and our commissioners, to that end, our commissioners are chaired by Lord Richard Best. He is a um, vastly experienced uh, housing professional. He, he was chief exec of the Joseph Rountree Foundation. He was chief exec of the National Housing Federation, which is a uh, body that represents all of the housing associations across the country. He is a very active parliamentarian. Um, chairs one of the committees on um, uh, older persons housing and has also chaired various other commissions he's based up in north yorkshire so he has a view from a different part of the country but a part of the country that also faces some of the issues that devon faces as you can see from the other list it's a variety of politicians uh, academics and uh, housing professionals um, so um, the Keith Miller there is the chair of Cavana Homes which is one of the largest sort of locally based developers private developers um, and we have um, landowners represented in Charles Courtney and um, housing associations as well so so that's the makeup of the commission now the rest of the presentation is more about the situation in Devon that the commissioners are looking at so first of all the key key things we're thinking about is affordability Devon is very difficult to afford to live in um, if you're from 
from from from the area. So across Devon, the average uh, affordability ratios is, is the sort of average incomes uh, and, and average house prices is ten point three five times the average income of the house price. But in some um, areas, it goes up. Some rural areas, it can go up to twenty eight times the average income, which is absolutely insane. And as you can see, it's uh, the England average still unaffordable at eight times, but even worse in Devon. Devon's a varied place, so you find that some parts of Devon, such as Plymouth, house prices are quite a lot lower than South Hams, but again, they've increased faster than in other areas of the country. And just a little stat there that shows um, Salcombe, one of our um, most probably famous seaside resorts, but also most expensive towns, seaside town in the country now, with an average house price of 1.2 million. And then you can see from this graph, uh, this map rather, the difficulties faced in the various different parliamentary constituencies around around Devon. Uh, and we presented this to the Commission to show that this really does have to be a cross party issue. You know, these are, are areas that are and will be represented by different parties, um, but um, they all have housing issues. So one of the first bits of work we did was looking at how earnings and house prices um, correlate. Uh, and so if you're trying to get onto the housing market, you're likely to be in looking at the sort of lower end houses. And so we decided to look at, compare that again with the lower quartile earnings and house prices. And uh, although this graph looks quite confused, if you look at the pink line in that first one, that's the sort of England uh, average house price and you see almost every local authority apart from Plymouth is above that in Devon. The uh, earnings um, give the opposite picture where England in pink is at the top and all the local authorities in Devon are below that so you can see already that that's going to cause significant issues with, with housing affordability. So are we building enough houses to try and cope with that? Well, you probably won't be surprised to hear we're not. Um, so this, I'm not going to read through all of these stats, but there are some um, big increases in, um, in homelessness. Um, the working age population grew, housing waiting list grew. These stats are all from 2021, by the way, but we are we do have more recent stats, but we're actually just sort of sense checking them all at the moment before we present them. Um, but uh, suffice to say they're not things aren't getting better yet um, so um, so you know some of the stark things you're seeing on here are, are magnified some of the stuff here around um, requiring urgent accommodation and we're, we're seeing that the amount of temporary accommodation that local authorities are having to provide has risen significantly over the last couple of years uh, we're currently just getting those figures now but in some cases it's triple what it was two years ago and three years ago uh, of a lot of the um, households seeking housing were, were looking for one and two bedroom accommodation, but only 500 units of that type of accommodation were built over this period of time and, and less than 100 of those were affordable. So you can see that perhaps where house building is going on doesn't appear to be meeting the need at the moment. And if we were to current continue at the rate of net additions to affordable stock, even if we close tomorrow, it would take 32 years to clear the backlog um, uh, of housing waiting lists. So that's quite a stark statistic, I think. If you can't afford to buy housing, can you afford to rent housing? Um, well, the private rented sector has seen a big decrease in the amount of available properties over the last few years. Certainly the pandemic had a part to play in that. People were holidaying here and uh, you probably would have picked up on news reports around things like Airbnb, um, Verbo, and homes going into the short-term let market rather than being uh, long-term let to people living in the area. So um, <clears throat> across Devon, if the private rent stock fell by around 50%, in North Devon, that was 67%. There were 67% fewer homes available on the private rented market. 
than there were a few years ago. And that's a real, real problem. Um, and again, adds to that requirement for local authorities to provide temporary accommodation for people who just can't afford or can't find property to live in. We're currently doing uh, some more in-depth work with um, getting figures for short-term lets. We support government's policies on licensing um, in, in certain areas where it's a real problem. Uh, and the commission wrote to government supporting that. Um, we'd like to see that um, that enacted as soon as possible, uh, so at least people know what they're dealing with. Um, we also have some statistics that say that potentially Airbnb um, and Verbo lettings might have peaked. We're seeing figures of the amount of homes available for letting is not being met by the amount of bookings coming. It, it, it is more than the amount of bookings coming in at the moment. So there were potentially signs that we reach a saturation point on that but we need more data to see and and you know we're already at a very high level anyway so even if it just stops now we're still um struggling with uh, availability of um rented stock <clears throat> empty and second homes as well we seem to have a have a an increase in the amount of empty homes um that have been seen um over 21, 22, you can see almost all the local authorities apart from Teambridge and Torridge have had an increase uh, in the amount of empty homes and homes out of use. Uh, and we're doing further work on, um, on that. There's some big increases in the amount of second homes in some areas, not all areas. So um, things like West Devon have had a big increase. South Ham's quite big, East Devon quite big, but there's already a lot of second homes there anyway. Um, so, so again, more statistics we're looking at at the moment, just to try and build that picture uh, across the county. Part of our work is looking at how Devon looks, uh, who are the people moving in and out of Devon. Uh, so we've been doing some work on the uh, aging population it's already england's oldest region in the southwest um, and we were looking at whether the po population people moving into devon are uh, aging moving in younger and aging here or moving in already over 65 uh, and there's some interesting statistics around that <clears throat> where it appears that people are moving to devon between the ages of 40 and 60. Uh, and then uh, that increases the working age population for a while, but then becomes a, a need for older person's accommodation at a later date, and there isn't enough older person's accommodation around. So we're, we're doing quite a lot of work on on population uh, and what's happening there. Um, and the interesting thing about Devon is it's so varied. So Exeter, for example, has uh, has a lot of students who will, <laughs> a lot of whom leave when they graduate. So that changes the, the makeup of, the, of Devon as a whole, but keeps Exeter in a certain, certain way. So we're looking at what can be done around that as well um, to increase sort of skills uh, and having the right skills to meet vacancies across the county. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the problem being that you don't have the housing to um, to support that growth in population in certain areas. This is a bit of a demonstration of how the population again is changing and aging. And you can see there that um, the, um, the somewhere like West Devon, um, the population of people 65 to 74 rose by 29%, while the number of residents 35 to 49 fell by 15%. So the population is changing uh, across the county. As a housing commission, what we want to try and do is use the opportunities we've got to think about uh, some of those challenges and many more that I've, I've, I've mentioned today. We are trying to pull together a comprehensive data set um, <clears throat> to get an agreement around the county about a set of metrics that we can all agree on and we can use as a sort of a, a baseline for our, our work. Um, we are able to gather evidence from across the, across the county uh, to recognize the issues, but more importantly, to think about ideas and solutions. We have a uh, an active call for evidence. We've received nearly, I think, nearly 400 responses so far to that, um, and uh, it would be really useful to get as many in as possible. So I will share the link, <coughs> excuse me, after this session so that we can do that. 
Now, the other really big opportunity that the Housing Commission um, sort of promotes is the partnership of local authorities next to, next to university. Um, and we need to build on that partnership. The Devon County Council and, and Exeter University recently signed a civic university agreement and the Housing Commission played a key part in one of the themes there around carbon considered housing. So we need to build on that and use the skills that are available in the university and the local authorities to come up with some um, really key recommendations and propose some lasting changes which will help tackle this housing crisis across Devon. I think I'm going to I'm going to leave it there. Um, there's my contact details, but hopefully that's given you a little a little run through of some of the challenges that we face. Um, and uh, I'm happy to take questions later on if anyone's got any uh, anything they want to to ask me. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. That was great. Um, lots of areas of work. I imagine your role is is kind of massive. Um, and maybe later we can talk a little bit about how health comes to play a role within those. Of course, yeah, areas. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we will move uh, on to Felicity's presentation. Felicity, are you there? I am, Chris. Sorry, I've spent the last Good. 10 minutes having to reboot my computer, so I'm, I'm hoping it's going to work now. That's some time. Um, so okay. let me see if I can share green is that okay can everyone see that okay um so uh, apologies if i'm repeating some of what matt just said like i say i had to um, leave the meeting so i was unfortunately unable to hear everything he said there might be a little bit of repetition in the first couple of slides but thanks very much for um giving um that's an opportunity to present our work today as Chris has said, uh, we were hoping Tom would um, deliver this presentation because he's the research fellow um, for the team um, and he knows more about this than the rest of the team do, um, but unfortunately he can't, so you've got, you've got me today. So Tom has been um, hosted by Torbay Council's uh, Public Health and Children's Services teams for the past couple of years as an embedded researcher. Um, the overarching aim of the project we've been running was to understand the factors behind Torbay's high rates of children in care and to look at how early help services can better support families um, to prevent children going into care. Now, during this project, housing has emerged as a really significant local challenge for families and for the service providers uh, aiming to support them. And we're currently writing a paper on this, and, and this paper is more or less what we're presenting today. So it's still in draft and any feedback from today would, would be very much welcomed. So just to begin with a bit of context, um, so this is probably what Matt's already covered. Um, nationwide, uh, as you know, we've got a housing crisis going on. It's a very complex issue. Um, fundamentally, for many decades now, insufficient housing um, and particularly genuinely affordable housing has been built to meet the growing needs of the population. Um, some interesting government data that, that I think came out today shows that uh, the really small number of social homes that were built in England between 2022 and 2023, um, a really shockingly low number um, compared to the number of households who have been accepted by councils as requiring help because they were homeless or in danger of becoming homeless. Um, income levels failing to keep up with housing, uh, rising house prices, um, and, and a, a decline, um, sorry, social housing in real decline. So I think Matt's covered most of that already, so I won't dwell on that. Um, what this situation's meant is, is it's pushed many families on low incomes into the private rented sector, with the proportion of families living in private rented accommodation trebling since 2003. Reports show that these families face high and rising rental costs, limited legal protection from evictions, and increasingly inadequate housing conditions. In the first quarter of this year, we hit a, a, a grim new national record with over 104,000 homeless households found to be living in emergency temporary accommodation. That's up 10% from the, from the previous year. Um, and this kind of emergency tempor temporary accommodation includes things like office block conversions, shipping containers, hotels, um, and B&B accommodation, 
often without sufficient space, cooking facilities or other basic amenities in which to um, raise a family. So our presentation today seeks to unpack the links between housing and children's social care. So, so it's important just for me just to give a bit of uh, context about the children's social care sector. Um, since about 2011, austerity uh, has meant that local authorities have, have faced really significant cuts to their budgets. And to weather these cuts, decisions have been made to prioritise ring fencing for funding statutory child protection work and to reduce funding for the more preventative early help and other family welfare service end of the spectrum. Um, and this has resulted in a 48% reduction in spending on early help services. Now we know from our research um, and, and other research that this preventative early help and support for families is really critical. It helps children to stay safely at home, to do better in school, to be physically and emotionally healthy and ultimately achieve their potential. But during this period, what we've seen is a worrying 26% rise in children entering state care across England. Um, this was in part what led to the recent independent review of children's social care, um, and, or, and it led them to conclude that England's child protection system has become increasingly focused on crisis management and more costly late interventions, and the outcomes for children are unacceptably poor. Now, surprisingly, when it comes to housing issues and homelessness, they've actually received little attention in children's social care policy practice or research in the past decades. In fact, England's so children's social care system does not collect any information on the housing circumstances of the families it works with, which is obviously not really helped with research in this area. We do know from recent studies that experiencing socioeconomic deprivation increases a child's likelihood of entering care. In fact, estimates show that the rise in child poverty between 2015 and 2022 was associated with an additional 10,351 children entering care. And although housing is an element of the measures of multiple deprivation used in these studies, there are currently no UK studies on the direct effects of housing on rates of children entering care. But service managers within the sector are pointing to shortages of affordable housing stock, overcrowding and rise of, rising evictions and homely, homelessness as being critical factors in the escalating numbers of families presenting to children's services in recent years. Now, if we look to the public health sector, we see that the role of housing as a social determinant of health is really already well established. You think of the Marmot Review, for example. The poor health outcomes arising from physical housing inadequacies such as damp and mold, toxins in the home, cold indoor temperatures, overcrowding and safety factors are really well documented. Um, What's less well documented is, is the fact that housing has important social, psychological and cultural value. Although this is less tangible, we see the experience of housing, including things like feelings of stability and security, access to personal space and so on, which, which really can also connect housing to uh, people's health and well-being. Now, as I mentioned, the research um, that we've been involved in has taken place in, in Torbay. Um, for those of you less familiar with Torbay, it's a unitary local authority um, in the southwest that has a long-standing tradition as a holiday destination. Um, but Torbay's rates of child protection investigations, plans and care orders have been significantly and consistently higher than both England and southwest averages over the last decade. In 2018, Torbay Council made it a priority to reduce the numbers of families entering the more costly and high intensity part of the child protection system by trying to improve its preventative early help offer. So our research project began in 2021 and it aimed to work in collaboration with service providers, voluntary and community sector groups and local residents to understand what was driving Torbay's high rates of cared for children and how early help could better engage and support families. Um, and although, as I said, housing wasn't the main focus of this project, it very quickly emerged as a really key factor for families and service providers across Torbay. Now, during this project, Tom was hosted as an embedded researcher, as, as I mentioned, and this allowed him to attend planning and strategy meetings, to observe practice, and to build relationships and trust with frontline practitioners. And that status as an embedded researcher is really quite, quite unique in enabling this level of insight. It's not the kind of thing that research um, is, is normally possible within the kind of research that we normally do. Um, 
The study also involved really significant community engagement, working closely with local uh, peer support groups, community centres, community cafes, businesses and faith groups. And um, our community connector, Suzanne Hughes, did a fantastic job of basically immersing herself in local communities. In terms of data collection, it was a mixed methods project, so qualitative and quantitative. Um, this is a breakdown of the sample of parents, organisations and professionals we, we spoke with via interviews and focus groups. The 56 parents and carers that took part in the study had a wide range of experiences from those who had had no previous interaction with um, children's services, but may have benefited from support through to those with experience of early help and those with experience of child protection plans or child removal and in cases, repeat child removals. In terms of the quant quantitative data, um, these were developed through collaboration with the research between the research team, the public health and children's services data analysts, and with guidance from uh, Paul Bywaters and Callum Webb, who are two of the UK's leading national researchers on analysis of children's social care data. Um, so I just want to run through some of our main findings here. Um, so child welfare, welfare inequalities is, is really important just to foreground some of the more specific housing um, related findings that I'll discuss later. So according to the Index of Multiple Deprivation, Torbay is the most socioeconomically deprived local authority within the Southwest. 27% of Torbay residents living in the top 20% most deprived areas in England. For a seaside resort like Torbay, tourism has been somewhat of a poison chalice because of the low skilled, low paid and seasonal nature of employment that it brings to the area. Um, it's also a sector that's been in decline since the 1970s with the advent of, of cheap overseas flights. Um, we also see that the peripheral location of Torbay combined with often poor transport links and connectivity leaves it quite cut off from the larger national economy and associated opportunities. When compared both regionally and nationally, we see Torbay is a significant outlier in terms of its high rates of domestic abuse, poor mental health and elevated levels of substance misuse. And these are, of course, all issues that are highly interlinked with poverty and also the factors that are commonly associated with child maltreatment cases. So we want to, wanted to explore how these socioeconomic factors were shaping demand on children's social care in Torbay. And to do this, the data subgroup linked Torbay's existing children's social care data to the index of multi multiple deprivation data. Um, the, res the results are represented in this graph, which show a social gradient in child welfare interventions in Torbay between April 2016 and March 2022. On your left is, is number one, which is on the neighbourhoods in Torbay with the highest proportion of children living in income deprived families. And then gradually you move along to the right uh, towards number 10, uh, which are the neighbourhoods with the lowest proportion of income deprived families. So the, and the blue bars are the rates at which child protection plans started in, the, in these neighbourhoods and the orange bars are the rates at, at which children became looked after, so go into care. And what this tells us is the more income deprived a neighbourhood a family and child lives in in Torbay, the more likely they are to experience a child protection plan or enter care. Contextualising child protection and care entry figures in, in this way allows us and service managers to see the stress that poverty has been placing on families' lives and the impact it has on child welfare and outcomes in Torbay. From the perspective of families, they often described how the stresses, conflict or difficulties in their lives had accumulated to the point where child protection proceedings occurred. They felt that if the right kind of support had been provided to them earlier, it would have avoided the need for statutory involvement in many cases. However, many parents and carers describe the existing support offers from children's services as being overly focused on things like courses regarding their parenting skills and, and their parenting knowledge. Now, while these kinds of courses and programmes can be helpful to people, such responses were often felt by parents just to exacerbate feelings of shame, blame and stigma against them as individuals. Many parents and carers wanted greater help with the underlying stresses in their family life, including with money worries and debt, respite or childcare, relationships, mental health and addiction. And furthermore, what came up time and time again was parents highlighting the need for better support around housing. And because from the outset of the research, housing featured so prominently, we kind of went away and looked at some of our data on, on this issue in Torbay and some of the existing data that's held by the council um, around the sort of acute issues around supply, affordability and quality of housing in the area. 
so it became very clear there's been a lack of good quality affordable housing being, being built over a number of decades. And this makes it really difficult for residents in Torbay to obtain suitable housing. We also found that Torbay has one of the lowest proportions of social housing of any English local authority at 8%. That's significantly lower than the national average of 18%. Now, this severe lack of social housing stock meant that in 2022, only 200 of the approximately 1,450 households on the social housing waiting list were actually allocated a property. Instead, low-income families are increasingly being pushed onto the private rental market in Torbay. We see this in figures that show that nearly 60% of housing benefit recipients in the area are renting privately, compared to just 29% in the southwest and 23% in England. So a really massive difference there. Um, and the data show that, that housing benefit recipients are more likely to be families with children. We also found that the local housing allowance that was allocated to families in Torbay does not generally meet the cost of renting in this area, meaning that many face the significant stresses um, in, in terms of uh, paying for rent, as well as other living expenses, particularly at the moment. Of the housing that is available, there's disproportion disproportionate levels of tour-based housing is in really poor condition, disrepair and without central heating. And we've, we've got some interesting data on that as well. Part of this is the result of the tourist trade's physical legacy with conversion of Victorian buildings and hotels into self-contained flats and houses of multiple occupancy, often outside the building regulations of the time. So there's something kind of quite unique about the geography and the history of this area as well that's worth thinking about. The issues around availability, affordability and stability of housing in Torbay are brought into stark relief when looking at family homelessness. This analysis compares the rate of family homelessness per 1,000 households with children. As you can see, between 2019 to 2022, Torbay's rate of family homelessness has been far higher than the English England average. It's a bit of a bit of a theme here. Um, it's higher also than the Southwest average and any of its statistical neighbours, illustrating just how acute and urgent the housing crisis is in Torbay and the direct impact it's having on parents and children. Um, if we look at some of the reasons why families become homeless, uh, we see generally it's because their, their tenancy in the private sector was ended. Um, or it's because people are escaping abuse or relationship breakdowns in their life, um, or obviously landlords um, reletting properties. Um, the reason why tenancies are ending um, can be due to people falling into rent arrears or increasingly landlords wishing to sell up, um, like I mentioned, to relet. Uh, and this reletting has increased by 14% um, in the past few years. We also found that when families do present as homeless to the local authority, they are almost always provided emergency temp temporary accommodation in hostels, bed and breakfasts and other pr private sector providers. These are typically enormously expensive and often not suitable for the needs of a family. And the council have, have recognised this as becoming a significant drain on their local resources. So just turning to some of the findings in terms of the interviews that were done with families, um, Families described housing shortages as becoming even worse since the onset of COVID-19, with landlords increasingly letting properties to short-term holiday makers and converting to Airbnb or selling to people who are relocating to the area and able to pay high prices. Um, as, as the quote here illustrates, parents often describe the battle on, on, on the private rental market to obtain a property and that people with children, bad credits and on low incomes were increasingly being squeezed out. And it's really difficult trying to get this housing because there's so much competition for it. Limited social housing in the area also meant enduring long waiting lists and fueled a perception that social housing was only being given to those with really the most severe difficulties going on in their lives. We heard from parents the enormous difficulties making their combined income and welfare benefits meeting, uh, meet the rising cost of rent and the soaring cost of living. The options available to families on the rental market, particularly when requiring larger properties, were often financially out of their reach, um, leaving them in precarious and unstable circumstances if, if they went for those houses or in overcrowded conditions if they didn't. Um, and of course, these struggles, these anxieties around tenancy, around not knowing whether or not you would have housing um, and around the poor quality of housing left many families feeling stressed, deeply anxious. 
We also heard that as private rental markets have become more competitive in Torbay, many people felt they had little option but to tolerate issues relating to repairs, maintenance and hazards in their home. Uh, the quote on the screen from, from Hurl here illustrates an example of this. She had a serious issue with damp and disrepair, which she'd been unable to resolve with her private landlord. She was desperate to move, but knew if she did, the cost of rentals would mean she had to downsize and share a room with her daughter. It was common for parents to describe feeling stuck in inadequate housing, not knowing their rights as tenants, and scared to confront landlords on the conditions in which they were living. Um, and for, for these reasons, many parents actually talked about wanting um, better access to housing information, to mediation and, and to advocacy. Um, so the third finding relates to um, housing could be an interlinking and often compounding factor in the complex needs of families who are already involved with children's services. And I think at, at this point, it's really important to stress that for, for the parents we worked with, who'd been on child protection plans or experienced child removals, housing was never the, never the only difficulty in their lives. I think it's, it's important to stress that there are a whole range of other things going on at the same time. Um, domestic violence, relationship breakdowns, addiction, mental health difficulties, high levels of special educational needs of both adults and children. Um, all of these were identified as, as common risk factors uh, by families, but also the professionals who were there to support them. Um, but to reiterate, we did find you know, housing problems were always seen as interlinking and compounding factors um, within this. So I just want to sort of go through a few stories from parents to try and illustrate how these things um, intersect. So firstly, is Steph's story, which helps to illustrate how a housing issue like overcrowding could limit the possibilities for parents to provide as they would like for their children. At the time we spoke to her, Steph was on a child protection plan, was struggling with depression, had survived domestic abuse and was in the process of trying to get an autism diagnosis for her young daughter. She was a young single parent and often felt overwhelmed trying to parent the best she could with the added pressure of children's services involvement and their concerns around her parenting capacity. Uh, in this quote here, she's talking about when a social worker asked her what she needed support with and she said that housing was the top of her priority list. Her and her two children were in a two bedroom house, which meant the children were sharing a room and keeping each other up at night. And that was affecting their behavior at school. And she was being pulled up on that by the school. To separate them, she had to put them in the two separate bedrooms while she had to sleep on the sofa in the living room. This issue was over, with overcrowding was important to her as it, as it heightened the existing strains on her mental health and wellbeing and the difficulty she was facing trying to demonstrate that she could parent her children and address their behavioural difficulties at school. We also spoke with many other parents who were in the process of trying to build a home, which included not only obtaining adequate and stable physical housing, as important as, as that of course was, but also demonstrating the performance of family life, the performance of relationships and routines to the standards expected by professionals and the family court system. Now, this was a particular issue for parents who had experienced repeat removals of children from their care. And on this slide is an extract from an interview we did with Karen and Rick. At the time, Karen had experienced six of her children being removed from her care, some removed as newborn babies. Here she describes how she was pregnant and caring for two of her children when social workers became involved. At the time, her and Rick were living in emergency temporary accommodation that was also housing drug users. One of um, one of whom experienced an, an overdose and fell down a flight of stairs um, whilst a social worker was there visiting them. Karen felt being housed in temporary accommodation alongside drug users not only influenced her own ability to provide the safe environment she wanted for her children, but also influenced professionals' perceptions of her family life. Although housing was not the only reason her children were eventually um, taken into care, there were concerns around her mental health and her parent, parenting abilities, Trying to find and build a stable home that proved that her and her partner could raise their baby in safety was a feature in decision making and inadequate housing was one of a group of identified risk factors. We found that parents who already had a family court record were often facing an uphill battle in convincing the courts that their parenting capacity had improved in the context of a new baby. This would often involve proving to professionals that there was an appropriate home for the child to return to and that that home was, was prepared with the things they would need. 
Um, so people, you know, were painting rooms and decorating and so on, just to sort of try and evidence this homemaking. The loss of entitlements to housing or benefits um, for families which can follow their children being removed can also mean parents then get stuck in a vicious cycle where children are not allowed to return home because the parents don't have appropriate accommodation because it's been removed because they don't have children anymore, whilst their entitlement to available financial support um, and accommodation depends on the children being in their care. The search for stability and security in finding new housing also featured prominently in interviews with women who had been on protection plans due, due to the domestic abuse perpetrated by their male partner. Moving was often an essential component of addressing the risks children's services had identified and proving that the children could be cared for in a stable environment away from the perpetrator of abuse. However, getting housing and the support needed to resettle into a bay where housing was so limited could be a real battle, with mothers feeling they really had to fight for the support they needed. And again, this is just another example of how housing was deeply interlinked in the lives of families and part of this constellation of risk and protective factors identified by the professionals involved. Our fourth finding was around transience and holiday homelessness in Torbay. So we found that families and professionals often describe Torbay as a place with a lot of transience in its population regular inward and outward migration and a seasonal ebb and flow of people moving to the area, often temporarily, often not laying down permanent routes. People working in children's services and housing described that some of this transience included very vulnerable families moving to the area, often leaving their key support networks behind and not anticipating the seasonality of local work and the housing difficulties within the area. As the housing officer here explains, these families were considered susceptible to falling into crisis and were seen as a significant source of demand on children's services. Frontline professionals also felt that this was a distinctive and often overlooked dynamic of, of working in a traditional seaside resort. They described that these vulnerable families were often escaping from difficulties to an ideal, idealized notion of a better life by the sea. Populations moving in and out of the area were also considered an important contributing factor in weakening and um, weakening of community ties, a declining sense of common vision, buy-in and belonging to the area, and so on. And in, in, in this respect, interlinking, interlinking issues around migration, transience and housing were seen to be bringing significant additional pressures on communities and families. And of course, this isn't an, an issue that's unique to Tor Bay. Um, it's some, but it is something that's being repeatedly highlighted in national reports on coastal poverty and regeneration. Um, and identifying potentially vulnerable families moving to Torbay and responding with effective early support for families is an ongoing area of policy and practice learning and development for managers and frontline staff. So our final findings around coordination between housing and children's social care. From uh, the time uh, that's been embedded with, within Torbay Council, it was clear that professionals working in child and family welfare saw housing as key to their work with families. It provided stability and helped maintain families' important connections to school, work and the support of wider family and friends. Frontline workers felt that issues relating to overcrowding, threats of eviction or homelessness um, escalated problems for families and exacerbated risks around domestic violence, drugs and alcohol and mental ill health. Crucially, teams also felt that during these housing emergencies, the support work that they could offer actually became less effective. We also found a common concern that families were just were not, were not getting housing support early enough. The complexities of local government, um, with departments often separated in their personnel, their procedures, their structures, and, and really importantly, their budgets, were seen to be a really huge difficulty in planning and delivering joined up services. People often said that housing is quite a siloed sector. Um, this was considered a national problem. Um, it's not just a Torbay problem. Um, and you know, there's very little generally that goes on in the way of linking housing departments with things like children's services and public health delivery. And these disconnects mean homeless families in Torbay were often being referred into children's services at the point of an acute housing emergency, particularly when families were found to be uh, intentionally homeless. Children's services professionals felt their involvement at this point simply added to the pressures and anxiety that these parents faced. Instead, they wanted far more concerted effort to identify a fam families who were approaching a crisis far earlier on and to support them much sooner to prevent them losing their housing 
um, and obviously address wider difficulties in the family. Much of this joint working is hampered by the lack of resourcing, of course. Um, yet recruiting more housing officers and evidencing their cost benefit is a really challenging thing to do. And I think that's partly because housing, you know, housing is never the only issue. It's one issue amongst others, but it's always there somewhere. Um, there's also a, a lack of council owned housing stock, which, which really limits the available housing options that are, are there to, to offer families anyway. Um, on the screen here, you can just see um, a picture of an event well, uh, we held at, um, in, in the zoo at Paynton actually, uh, earlier in the year, which brought together service providers, local authority uh, representatives and community groups, and the families that participated in the research to discuss our findings and agree next steps. And this was quite a rare opportunity where people from these diverse backgrounds are actually brought together on an equal footing. In total, we made nine recommendations to the council uh, and they were all agreed um, and accepted by the council and they're in the process of being implemented. Um, in terms of work in progress on housing, um, like many other uh, local authorities, Torbay has actually established a housing company to develop, acquire and regenerate more affordable housing and temporary accommodation. But as in other areas, this is a very really complex and difficult area and that has faced a number of, of challenges recently. Um, but, but people, I think it's a real reflection of local councils just really tiring of the very slow progress that's being made by national government to, to build housing. Um, we have seen better communication, coordination and, analysis, and analysis across housing and children's services teams. Uh, there's been better integration of the housing officer into the early help team as well, which has been really beneficial and families have said how helpful that's been. Um, also seen community based housing support, such as housing surgeries to provide advice to people in the area. In terms of drawing some wider conclusions, um, housing circumstances can trigger crisis situations which lead to the involvement of children's services. Local authority departments and frontline professionals face a myriad of challenges delivering coordinated services that meet families, housing and their wider welfare needs. We also discuss in our paper that housing policy, law and practice often mistakenly frame housing issues as distinctly physical bricks and mortar problems. Um, and that this fuels the kind of siloing of responses that we see nationally. Instead, um, we, we're trying to argue in this paper, housing issues should be seen as encompassing a range of vulnerabilities across the life course, including mental health issues, drug and alcohol use, trauma, violence, education and employment difficulties, and so on. Um, we argue that housing needs, um, needs to be given a far more prominent place within children's social care policy and practice. And we suggest that housing should be understood as shaping the possibilities of parents to create or make home and to actually enact family life. Um, this is crucial in children's social care because it's how families live that is routinely scrutinised, assessed and acted upon. And from the perspective of parents, it can be very difficult to evidence good parenting whilst living in poor housing. We also look at how our findings fit into concepts of levelling up localism and place-based solutions, which are now an increasing aspect of government strategies. Um, we won't go into much detail about this, but obviously substandard housing stock is clearly one of the most important socio-economic disadvantages facing English seaside resorts um, and it's long frustrated regeneration efforts in those kinds of areas. Um, and one of the things we're trying to do in this research is point to the knock-on effects this has on communities, families and local services. We also argued that in addition to further studies measuring the direct effects of housing on entry rates into, into um, child into care, we need to unpack further how concepts of risk, responsibility and capability are being mobilised in relation to families who are unstably housed or homeless. Here it's important to highlight that within England's child welfare policy and practice framework, issues like child abuse and neglect are often individually understood and dealt with in a context where risk is omnipresent and attached to individuals' actions or inactions, choices or characters. Um, this come, comes from, uh, from Brid Featherston, who's an expert in, in um, child protection. This individualised risk focused approach, however, frequently obscures the deep rooted role that socioeconomic circumstances, including housing, exhibit on familial environments and resources. There's also some, some research um, 
to suggest that unstably housed families might experience a fishbowl effect, whereby the uh, by virtue of their increased engagement with with um, housing services, housing systems or services, they become more visible to authorities and prof professionals, and in turn to negative judgments about their parenting capabilities. And that's an area where we we are arguing that a lot more work needs to be done to really understand those issues. So sorry, I've been talking for ages. I'll shut up now. Thanks. Thank you, Felicity. Uh, that was great. It, it, it was a great opportunity to know more aspects about that amazing project. Um, we will have a short five-minute pause uh, for our captioner. So in the meantime, I, anyone who has any question could share it on the chat or write it down somewhere to then um, open the camera maybe and, and ask the questions. Uh, so we will return at... Um, four and one minute, if that's okay. And then we'll have our questions.
Okay, here we are again. Um, thank you, Felicity. Matt, are you there? Thanks. Uh, so, um, as I said, if anyone has any question, please raise your hand or write it in the chat. I, I will start with two questions. Uh, this is not my own area of work, but um, I have a couple of questions. So one is for Matt and one is for Felicity. And, and for Matt, uh, at some point in your presentation, you mentioned the kind of the economic case of investing more on affordable housing. And, and I was wondering because the the, the 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 economic case is usually raised as a tool to um, somehow push policymakers to make a rational decision. It, it makes sense to invest in in affordable housing because then you can save on a number of other things in in the future. And I was wondering if this if you think this is still this is still a powerful kind of a um tool to 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 create awareness and create change and, and what other things can quote unquote science do to contribute to pushing an agenda and in, in the in this area and then for felicity um I, I know that you work a lot on on mental health too and 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 particularly on medicalization the medicalization of concerns uh, including housing concerns probably as a, as a key driver of anxiety and many other other conditions and 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 issues and i was wondering what is like from from the work on this project on all the complex the complexity surrounding housing how do you then look at this from a from a from a mental health perspective like how what can services or providers or practitioners what can they do? How can how should they understand this aspect of people's lives in order to provide better services or or be more effective in the in the care that they are trying to to give? So those are my questions. And then uh, after your responses, we can open up for Bojana and others. Thank you. Um, so sim sort of simply, yes, economic growth should be a great argument for more and more investment in affordable housing. Um, but with any sort of um, investment from government, there is usually a part reliance on the private sector, which in housing is is particularly the case, and um, that um, then relies on things like land availability planning and all and um uh sites coming forward landowners being willing to sell those sites for a reasonable amount to private developers planning conditions being met to provide affordable housing so um, all those sorts of things the investment that you put into that has to balance against um the investment that you sort of um, put into all, all aspects of government funding. So I think uh, when working for Homes England, we saw a lot of extra money go into affordable housing, and that's really, really positive. But you still need to have the, the structure around that to make it work. So you still need to have, you know, you put lots of money into affordable housing in a, um, in a government agency, for example, but at the same time, you're cutting local authority funding so that you don't have planners uh, to who can who can that in a, in a timely way because they just don't have the, um, the, uh, the 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 capacity to do that. Then you're still holding up on that um, uh, that that thing. So you know you can make the case to government. And I think all governments see the need for um, for affordable housing and the the, the 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 positive benefits it brings but it needs so much more structure around the rest of it in order to make it a success um, and you know and things like if you want to encourage economic growth in areas like Devon uh, things like offshore wind and uh, things like that then you're going to need to be able to house people who come to work on those things and that's why it's really important that housing is seen as linked to economic growth we've seen it in Somerset with the um, Hinkley point thing and the housing solutions that are brought in around there um, and and there are there are certain sort of energy uh, offshore energy things in Devon where we'll need to think about that and so so investing in housing for that will definitely increase economic growth but like I say 
you know, putting those big investments into affordable housing needs the whole structure around it to work. Thank you. Uh, Felicity, you want to go with? Uh, yeah, and just actually to just follow on from something um, Matt was just saying about um, affordable housing, it's one thing that we see in terms of um, recruiting and retaining staff, very key staff as well. So, um, you know, social workers, uh, health workers and so on. Um, you know, if people can't afford to, to live in an area, then they're going to be put off going there. And we, and we know that that's a problem in the southwest. Um, so, yeah, and, and we see a, a very high turnover of, of staff. Uh, in in the social work area in in the southwest um because people can't afford to be here and they can't afford to to buy decent housing that's anywhere near their place of work um but just to go back to your question um which was around medicalization and mental health perspective and what practitioners can do differently um it's quite a big question chris um but i think i mean what we see in in the primary care and medicalization world is that the problem is seen as an individual problem that there's something wrong with you know it's, it's a pathological problem of an individual and that's the way it's dealt with rather than looking at the broader context in which somebody's um, mental distress is being experienced um, you know of course anyone facing all of these different challenges are going to you know, is going to feel distressed by that uh, and, and I think it's a similar thing here in, term, in terms of children's social care. Individuals very often get looked at, well, sorry, people get looked at under scrutiny as individuals of risk, rather, again, than, than looking at why that, that situation has come about and what are those broader circumstances driving that risk and what can be done then to help minimise that risk by supporting that person rather than seeing them as a... Um, somebody who needs to be contained and managed and so on. So I think, you know, this goes back to what we're talking about um, with things like parenting programmes. You know, there's this sort of notion that if only you can educate parents to, to be better parents, then everything else will be solved. And of course, that's that's sometimes the case that those kinds of programmes can, can do that. But very often it's a tiny, you know, it might help a tiny, tiny bit. But What's stopping parents being good parents is all of those other challenges that they're facing. So I think some, you know, generally it comes to that comes down to a broader recognition of the circumstances and challenges in which people are living. Um, very often with people with families where children go into care, you'll see that that person themselves also grew up in care. That's not always the case, but there's a very high proportion um, of people for whom that's the case. So those cycles of difficulty repeat and repeat and repeat um i think so, so it's about seeing those broader contextual circumstances but it's also about looking beyond that person as a risk it's about building that relationship of trust so that people actually feel like they can come forward for support at an early stage rather than it reaching a crisis situation one of the big problems that we see is is that that, that trust and relationship isn't in place so people don't reach out for support. Um, so yeah, that that's really critical here, listening to people, believing people, and actually being on the ground with people. And I think one thing that's happened since probably since COVID, really, a legacy of that is that there's not much on the ground working. Um, social workers these days don't have to be out and about in their communities as much as they once were. That's partly because of the development in online technology. It's partly because of the vast amounts of bureaucracy and the systems that they're tied to that, you know, basically dictate what has and doesn't have to happen. Um, but I think it's a culture change as well. Um, you know, we're all guilty of it. Well, I say we, I am. You're not, Chris. You're always in the office. Um, but I'm not. Um, so I think it's all of those things. Yeah, that's interesting how how like the post-COVID technological development make makes it easy to ignore certain dimensions of people's problems in a way. Uh, so Bojana, you can uh, ask your question. Hi, hello, thanks. Um, I'll just also lower my hand. Um, 
yeah, I was just wondering, um, I mean, this is kind of like super anecdotal uh, because I live uh, here in the area um, in Totnes uh, by the grace of God and my landlord. Um, and I'm noticing, uh, so I've, I've lived here for nearly 20 years and I'm noticing a real kind of like exodus, if you like, of uh, people often, you know, um, you know, adult children or friends and all that, you know, like having their own kids and all that. And then people classically move to Torbay because that is where you, you know, kind of like housing benefit will just about cover your rent. Um, and I think the situation is very much like a, almost what, what Felicity was talking about, you know, like this kind of like substandard housing stock, you know, almost kind of like slum landlords, which, you know, in exchange for accepting housing benefit, you know, this kind of like informal transaction of like living in a terrible house without heating, but we will let you live here on housing benefit. So I'm just wondering if, um, you know, so again, my anecdotal impression is that Torbay is, um, there's just this kind of like layering of almost these people who have been left to this, you know, most kind of like slow death sort of like scenario. So it just struck me, Chris, when you were talking about like a rational public health aspect of it makes sense to improve people's housing. It just struck me, you know, to what extent do you think that perhaps on a kind of like macro level, uh, this rational aspect breaks down when it is um, viewed in relation to these, well, sort of like dehumanized populations, really? Um. I could, I don't know if I can answer the whole question, but um, the certainly um, one of the things the commission looked at when we went to Ilfracu, which has a lot of similar issues to Torbay actually, and was described as a bit of a mini Blackpool by some of the sort of housing professionals in there who have been working on Blackpool recently with HMOs and things like that, and the link to to link between health and housing and how important that is uh, and we sort of started to work with the integrated care system and we're, we're starting that process now about having housing we've all got loads of data and loads of information but it doesn't often cross into one another so you, you, you get housing strategies done and you get medical health strategies done and they don't cross into each other so part of what we're doing is trying to bring that together a bit more so that when when um, health strategies are devised housing plays a key role a useful role in it it's not just mentioned as a byproduct which is something that the integrated care board people and i'm just getting my head around how the nhs integrated care systems works it's incredibly complicated as far yeah. as i can see um but but we, we've had some really useful meetings with those guys about how we can bring that together and mesh it a bit so it's a bit more you know brought brought in we heard some really startling statistics that were slightly anecdotal in ilfra Coombe, so we couldn't we, we're trying to get it a bit more a bit more firm but some of the um intensive care uh, when people have gone into intensive care or, or after they'd come out, hopefully, um, they were asked about their housing situation. And there's something like 90% of the people in the ICU unit at some points were in poor substandard or housing need that, that you know, their needs weren't being met. It was having that big an impact on it. So there's definitely a view that we want to try and bring bring all that together a bit more and use the data a bit more wisely. Thank you. I don't know if you want to add something to, to that. Um, no, I guess, I guess this isn't answering the question. Sorry, Brianna. Um, but I think it's important just to say that, you know, what we don't want to be trying to do here is sound like we're criticising the local authority in their approach. You know, they are under such resource constraints here. And of course, there's things that can be improved as they can in any kind of workplace environment, um, including our own. Um, but one of the important things that we've been able to really understand through doing this research or an embedded approach is by sitting in on those meetings, hearing those discussions about strategy and about decision making and about resource constraints. It's a real eye opener. And um, as an academic sitting from afar, you know, I think it's very easy for us just to criticize what's going on out there. And actually, we need to recognize 
what's really going on for everybody else who's in the system. You know, everybody means well, everyone's trying to make things better, um, but very often the systems are not set up in a particularly good way to, to make that simple. You know, just the fact that everyone's got separate budgets and so on, there's, there's, there's not that kind of cross-sector working that Matt was just talking about. It's, it's quite often an exception rather than a norm. Um, I mean, it does go on, but not as much as you might hope it would. Um, but the, the resource constraints are so severe on local yeah. authorities now. It is, it's mind-bogglingly terrifying. Um, mm -hmm. so, sorry, that's not answered your question at all. Um, no, I mean, it has been really helpful to hear uh, what, especially what you were saying about, you know, like all the different kind of like the, the separation in terms of funding. Um, so I'm, at the moment working on a project called humanizing healthcare for people with learning disabilities and i'm really noticing a similar thing there where there, uh, there is almost this um um you know different i mean the, the, the phrase makes me actually want to be sick but you know the pots of money you know so there are the different pots of money and you know like no one wants to be responsible for the person because obviously it's a kind of like expenditure and um you know and their situation is such that they are relying on those kinds of like funding so it's kind of like almost a life spent like being kind of like passed from one um you know pot to another one institution to another but that um yeah it's just kind of like really mind-boggling isn't it because this is public money and uh, one would hope that uh you know mm -hmm. it's there to help people and not so sort of like ring fenced for yeah anyway yeah no and and I, I don't disagree at all. I mean, I think you know, the funding is spread so thin and mm -hmm. people's remits, you know, we, what, we've, what we've seen as well is in some cases, people being quite defensive about what their remit is because people have tried to bring them into other programmes and, and there's a reluctance to do that because people are already doing more than they feel that they should be doing. And, and I think as well for children's social care, um, you know, the role of regulatory bodies such as Ofsted plays a really big part as well in terms of what people feel able to do and the priorities that they feel that they have to set. Apologies for the cats, it's just food time. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, people are very often, people are bound up with those systemic pressures that, you know, they have to follow up with as well, because if they don't, then then that has quite catastrophic consequences as well so there's there's those sort of different levels of having to you know meet regulatory requirements as well as do the on the ground stuff um it's it's a really difficult situation yeah mm. thanks so much thank you okay thank you Bujana. and now mary please I can't turn my camera on, I'm afraid. I'm getting a, an error about that. But anyway, thank you for um, two really fascinating presentations. Um, I was just going to ask Felicity if she could uh, comment a bit more on the embedded researcher approach. You, you, you talked about it a little bit uh, just now, but I wondered if there was any resistance or challenges you faced with with them um, having a, a researcher embedded in this process? Um, there's been many challenges um, along the way, but actually you know, the council were very receptive um, and we're all still talking to each other. And I think we've all found it a really informative process. Um, it, it's, um, no, I, th I think they, I think they could see the benefits of um, impartial researchers coming in, um, taking a look at some of the data, you know, doing those things that they don't have time to do very often. You know, there's not time and space within local authorities to do a great deal of research. Um, and very often they have to they have to buy it in if they do it at all. And that's that's expensive. And people don't have a lot of money for that kind of thing now. So we got our funding from uh, somewhere else. So we did, didn't cost the council anything. Um, so that was a real benefit for them. Um, and I think some of the challenges have been, you know, when we can see things are not working and when, we ha when we've had local communities that have been very critical, um, you know, of course people are gonna not necessarily want to hear that. 
I think you know there's mm-hmm. there's been a level of defensiveness um, at times which is not surprising but doesn't then necessarily help move the conversation forward but I think you know we've, we've had quite challenging conversations along the way um, and ultimately the recommendations are based on good evidence from a large number of people within that community so um, I think what we've had to learn to do and again this is something I think as a normal researcher you don't really have to do is just is to think through useful policy recommendations what actually is feasible to do rather than having really quite abstract recommendations that are meaningless within the world of policy and the resource constraints of policy actually trying to be realistic about what can be done um and and so so i think that's that's been quite good for us in terms of, of learning um i mean we've been lucky in that the people we've been working with have been quite open-minded about about the value of research and they've actually now employed a um to put someone in a research post in the council now working with the public health team um so they have seen the value of doing this kind of thing which is great yeah it sounds Um, very positive it is really positive and I, i have to say as well i mean tom's not here today but tom is the most perfect person for doing this because he is the world's best diplomat Mm-hmm. um whereas i i'm not um tom manages you know, the, by the end of the project everybody still loves tom um so there's there's a certain type of person that is good for embedded research and it's not all of us <laughs> <laughs> thank you and i'm sorry i couldn't turn my camera on i don't know what's happened but anyway no, don't worry thanks anyway <laughs> okay so i think we are at the end of the seminar. Uh, thank you very much, um, Matt. Thank you very much, Felicity. It's always a pleasure to listen to your work. I hope that the connection both between your work and, and further connections across the center can be made with Matt's work. Uh, we really support your crusade. And, and if there's anything we can contribute from a health social science perspective, then that's uh, we, we, we will have it to do it. So uh, yes, Tom, do, Matt, sorry, do you want to come? No, I was just going to say thank you very much. That would be really useful. And uh, I think um, I definitely will um, we'll be in touch again. So uh, thanks. Okay, yes. So thanks, everyone. And we'll see you in um, January for the next uh, uh, seminar from the Welcome Center. Okay, so goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.